Well, it is that time. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Greenberg, and I'm the director of the uh, Special and Digital Collections Department. I'm also acting director of the USF Libraries Holocaust and Genocide Study Center. And it's, uh, it's a, a great pleasure to have you out this afternoon. We're very, very glad that you're, you're here for a program that brings together several elements of uh, university uh, programming. One, of course, is the fact that the Libraries Holocaust and Genocide Study Center, uh, which has been around now for a little over a year, offers a series of public events um, each semester intended to offer opportunities to discuss various aspects in the history uh, and uh, current events of uh, Holocaust, genocide, and crimes against humanity. And of course, this particular event is co-sponsored by the Libraries Holocaust and, and Genocide Study Center. And the other is that this month represents uh, an annual commemoration or celebration of Native American history. And each year, the library has had an opportunity to work with the uh, USF, the Office uh, of Diversity and Equal Opportunity at USF, which has been very supportive of uh, Native American history. and we had a, I, I thought, a really uh, unique and, and interesting opportunity to combine themes of Holocaust and genocide studies uh, with Native American history. And so that's what we're going to, to do today. And of course, we're, we're pleased that you're here uh, for that. Today's speaker, uh, I had an opportunity uh, to meet back in, in April of this, this past year. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Madley was attending a conference, uh, giving a paper at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, it was an international uh, conference of uh, graduate students and recent graduate students uh, working in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. It brought about 55 of some of the very brightest people in Holocaust and Genocide Studies from around the world to Clark University for a conference, and, and Ben was there. and. Uh, giving a paper, and I was a fly on the wall, um, and we got a chance to get to know each other a little bit. And uh, I had known the moment that I heard his paper uh, at Clark and got a chance to, to talk to him a little bit uh, informally that I wanted to get him to, to USF. And of course, uh, given his research interests, uh, this was a, a perfect opportunity to do that. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Madley. He earned a BA in history from Yale University before taking a master's degree in history at Oxford University in England. He earned a PhD in history from Yale University this past May. He's authored several articles on colonialism, genocide, and the Holocaust, including an article called Patterns of Frontier Genocide, 1803 to 1910, and another article from Africa to Auschwitz. Um, excuse me, and uh, another from terror to genocide, uh, Britain's Tasmanian penal colony and Australia's history wars. His most recent published article called California's Yuki Indians, Defining Genocide in Native American History, was published in the Western Historical Quarterly. And his next article, The Tactics of Colonial Massacre, will be published next year. Uh, Dr. Madley is currently turning his dissertation entitled American Genocide, the California Indian Catastrophe, 1846 to 1873 into a book manuscript. His talk today is called The Question of Genocide in America, Meaning, Debate, and New Frameworks. Dr. Madley, welcome. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Mark, and everyone here at the library who has made my visit possible. And I would like everyone to know that I will be available for questions uh, after I give my talk. But I'd like to go through the entirety uh, of the lecture for continuity's sake and ask you to hold your questions until the conclusion. Native Americans suffered a catastrophic demographic decline following contact with Europeans. From a pre-contact population estimated at 5 million or more, Native Americans within the continental United States and its colonial antecedents were reduced to some 240,000 or thereabouts by 1880 to 1900. This cataclysm thus ranks among the greatest of all population disasters in world history. 
Scholars agree that Old World, that is European, African, and Asian diseases, to which American Indians had no immunity, were the primary cause of this catastrophe. While colonialism and violence played important secondary roles, yet academics continue to debate whether or not Native Americans, or any groups of them, suffered genocide. Today I'd like to explore, first of all, why the question matters to scholars, American Indians, and all Americans, before surveying the polarized American genocide debate. Finally, I'd like to propose some new methods of inquiry involving detailed case studies, a focus on statements of genocidal intent by leaders at the tops of control structures, massacres, and mass death under United States custody. And by doing so, I hope we can move the debate forward. The near annihilation of North America's indigenous peoples remains one of the formative events in United States history. Along with wars, real estate transactions of often dubious legitimacy, the making and breaking of treaties, forced removal, relocation and confinement on reservations, and the 1887 Dawes Allotment Act, the American Indian population cataclysm played a central role in the clearing of hundreds of millions of acres for colonization. That is, the vast geography and natural re resources upon which the United States is today built. Please come forward and take a seat. You don't have to stand in the back. Oh, no problem. It's fine. The more the merrier. Come take a seat. You don't have to stand. Uh, so how we explain the Native American population catastrophe fundamentally explains how we understand the United States and its colonial origins. In 1622, Mayflower passenger Robert Cushman wrote of America, our land is full, by that he meant England. Their land, and by that he meant Indians' land, is empty. This, then, is a sufficient reason to prove our going thither to live lawful. Their land is spacious and void, and they are but few and do run over the grasses. They are not industrious, neither have they art, science, skill, or facility at using their land or the commodities upon it. All spoils, rots, and is marred for want of manuring, gathering, and ordering. What Cushman was doing was articulating two very important legal theories, the theory of vacuum domicilium and the theory of terra nullius. These are the legal ideas upon which many would attempt to justify the colonization and theft of land in North America. What Cushman claimed was that Indians did not inhabit their homelands fully enough, either in density or in Western European terms of economic development, to justify ownership, particularly in so-called empty areas. Cushman was not alone in such thinking. In 1516, the English lawyer Thomas Moore anticipated that colonists would, and preachers John Dunn and John Cotton, and even Pennsylvania proprietor William Penn later asserted that legally they could seize void and vacant, abandoned, or unfilled, or waste or uncultivated country. Quickly diminishing Indian populations, and thus buttressing the specious vacuum domicilium and terra nullius theories in some whites' minds, European, African, and Asian diseases killed vast numbers. Thus emerged the almost canonical trope of Indian population decline as a natural disaster, and the expropriation of increasingly empty quote unquote, Indian land as a just response to opportunities created by regrettable but inevitable natural devastation. Now, disease did kill untold numbers of native peoples in North America. Yet what I argue is that the emphasis that we place upon disease as the primary agent of demographic decline mutes the role of violence in the population catastrophe and in the United States conquest. 
Exploring whether or not such violence constituted genocide means examining the role of human agency and potential criminality. It means, quite simply, exploring whether or not some Americans committed what legal scholar William Shabas has called the crime of crimes. It necessitates exploring the possibility of evil at the very core of American history, or at least that of some United States regions. These are difficult issues. Still, the question of genocide in America needs to be addressed on conference agendas and as a topic of debate as it has been off and on for decades because the stakes are so high for scholars, native peoples, and all Americans, both Indian and non-Indian. If some regions of the United States, if not the nation as a whole, were founded on deliberate attempts to annihilate native peoples, scholars will likely reevaluate current historical interpretive axioms and address new quandaries. Scholars may, for example, re-examine the assumption that indirect effects of colonization, like disease, rather than deliberate actions, like murder, were the leading cause of death in most or all encounters between non-Indians and Indians. Exceptionalist interpretations of United States history may also come under fire as scholars compare American genocides to other mass killings and place those within global comparative frameworks. Where instances of genocide are found, it will be necessary to evaluate what roles colonial, federal, state, or territorial governments played, if any, as well as whether or not the event was part of a sporadic or frequently recurring regional or national pattern. Larger questions then follow. For example, what tended to catalyze genocide? Was it inevitable or was it the result of deliberate human actions? Why don't we know more about these events? Did democracy in the United States drive mass murder? And ultimately, was the United States founded on genocide? The genocide question is particularly urgent for the United States' approximately 4.1 million citizens of self-reported Native American ancestry given its political, economic, psychological, and health ramifications. The political and economic implications are substantial. Should tribes press for official government apologies, monetary reparations, and control of land where genocidal events took place? How should Native American communities commemorate mass murder while also emphasizing successful accommodation, resistance, survival, and present cultural renewal. If someone, an academic, for example, or government official or tribal member, publicizes the genocide that was suffered by a tri particular tribe, will others then misinterpret this as proof that that tribe no longer exists? The psychological issues related to genocide are also fraught. What happens when a tribal member learns that he or she is a descendant both of perpetrators and victims? How will Indians reconcile increased knowledge of genocide, sometimes at the hands of the United States, with often intense patriotism, manifest in centuries of disproportionate volunteering for the United States Armed Forces? Finally, and perhaps most importantly, what role might acknowledgment of genocide have on historical post-traumatic stress disorders and their connection to present-day illnesses, substance abuse, domestic violence, and suicide. The question of genocide in the history of the United States and its colonial antecedents also poses explosive political, economic, educational, and psychological questions for all Americans, both native and non-native. Recognition and reparations are central issues. Should elected government officials tender apologies, as presidents George Bush and Ronald Reagan did in the 1980s for the relocation and internment of some 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II? Reparations then are an important subordinate issue. Should federal officials in Washington offer rep reparations along the lines of the more than $1.6 billion that Congress awarded to 82,210 of these Japanese Americans and their descendants? 
The question of commemoration is closely linked as well. Will non-Indian Americans support or tolerate the public commemoration of mass murders committed by their forefathers with the same kinds of monuments, museums, and state legislated days of remembrance that today commemorate the Holocaust and the Armenian Genocide? Will genocides against Native American peoples join these systematic mass murders in public school curricula or public discourse? Initial steps toward federal acknowledgment of the wrongs done to Native peoples are underway. In 1989 and then in 1990, Congress passed the National Museum of the American Indian Act and the Nat Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, known in short as NAGPRA, which in combination mandate that federally funded institutions protect Native grave sites and return human remains and objects taken from Native Americans under certain circumstances. Then in the year 2000, Bureau of Indian Affairs head Kevin Gover marked the Bureau's 175th anniversary by publicly apologizing for the organization's role in the lethal trail of tears and, quote, the ethnic cleansing that befell the Western tribes, end quote. Gover, who is himself a Pawnee Indian, also acknowledged, quote, the cowardly killing of women and children and tragedy on a scale so ghastly that it cannot be dismissed as merely the inevitable consequence of a clash of competing ways of life. Four years later, seven United States senators and two congresswomen introduced a joint resolution to acknowledge a long history of official depredations and ill-conceived policies by the United States government regarding Indian tribes and offer an apology to all Native peoples on behalf of the United States. This resolution specifically noted how, quote, Native peoples suffered and perished during forced removal, during bloody armed confrontations and massacres, and on numerous reservations, end quote. After failing in 2004, senators and congressmen reintroduced the joint resolution in 2005, again in 2007, and for a fourth time with 39 senators and congresspeople co-sponsoring in April this year. The resolution does not specifically address genocide. Still, by coming so very close to the issue, it generates substantial political resistance as well as ever-increasing support because the stakes are so high. Ultimately, the possibility that genocide occurred in United States history, both before and after 1776, throws United States national identity into question. How will we make self sense of ourselves as a nation if some regions or even the entire country are founded upon the crime of crimes, taken together with the many other explosive issues raised by the question of genocide in American history it is a little wonder that scholars have largely avoided the question, or that it remains largely unresolved. Still, the deadlocked American genocide debate itself is also to blame. So now I'd like to discuss that polarized historiography. White violence against Native peoples has been a topic of sporadic discussion, and it had already been for centuries by 1880. In that year, however, the conversation took a dramatic turn Former United States Indian Affairs Commissioner George Washington Moneypenny, who was the head of the entire Indian Affairs system in Washington, D.C., now wrote the first book addressing extermination, genocide's 19th century linguistic equivalent across American history. In his pioneering work, Our Indian Wards, which ranged from colonial times through the 1870s, Moneypenny described and quoted Indians exterminated, threats and plans to exterminate American Indians, concerns regarding Native Americans' extermination, and the process of extermination itself. The following year, the author and activist Helen Hunt Jackson published her now famous history, quote, of the United States government's dealings with some of the Indian tribes. Her work, called A Century of Dishonor, did not address extermination per se, but did describe what Ulysses S. Grant's 1869 Indian Commission called, and I quote, a sickening record of murder, outrage, robbery, and wrongs, end quote, while chronicling numerous atrocities and massacres. The author and future president, Theodore Roosevelt, then disparaged 
many pennies and Jackson's books as, and I quote, worse than useless in his triumphal four volume, The Winning of the West, and the debate was on. Decades later, Nazi mass murder catalyzed the development of a new theoretical and legal framework for discussing crimes of extermination. In 1943, the Polish Jewish legal scholar Raphael Lemkin coined a new term for an ancient crime. Defining the concept in 1944, he combined the Greek word genos, meaning tribe or race, with the Latin side for killing to describe as genocide any attempt to physically or culturally annihilate an ethnic, national, religious, or political group. Lemkin then became the driving force between, behind the United Nations adoption of the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, which more narrowly defined genocide as, we see up here, acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group, group as such. And the convention enumerates five specific crimes, which we see up here. Um, and I'm going to leave this slide up because we're going to talk about some other definitions of genocide. So you can use this as I'm talking to compare and contrast. Responding to Nazi mass murder, the new genocide concept, and the international legal treaty, two men began re-examining the United States colonization of the North American continent. In 1946, the journalist Kerry McWilliams compared California's Franciscan missionaries to, quote, Nazis operating concentration camps, end quote. Several years later, Lemkin himself planned chapters on, quote, genocide against the American Indians and the Indians of North America for two different genocide histories. However, he died in 1959 before he could complete either work. Most Americans knew little about genocide or the Holocaust until 1961. In that year, however, the media glare illuminating the trial of SS Lieutenant Colonel Adolf Eichmann, in combination with the release of the Academy Award-winning legal thriller Judgment at Nuremberg, which I recommend everybody see if you haven't seen it yet, introduced the scope and the horrors of the Holocaust to many Americans. Holocaust-related art, literature, media, and scholarship then proliferated in the 1960s and 1970s. Meanwhile, these turbulent American decades saw continuing civil rights activism, new left historians' assault on triumphal United States history narratives, rising American Indian political activism, new Native American studies departments across the country, and renewed interest in American Indian history. Cross-pollinating with rising Holocaust and genocide awareness, these various movements produced a small but growing chorus calling white treatment of Native Americans genocide. In 1966, the Cree Indian folk singer-songwriter Buffy St. Marie sang of, and I quote, the genocide basic to this country's birth. Academics wrote about genocide in America two years later, and in the 1970s, American Indian activists were also using the term. By 1979, Native American studies scholar Jack Norton argued that according to the United States Genocide Convention, certain Northwestern California Indian tribes had suffered genocide under United States rule in the 19th century. President Ronald Reagan then focused additional public attention on the issue of genocide by endorsing the Genocide Convention shortly before the 1984 presidential election. And that was, as a side note, in response to the public furor over his having publicly visited uh, and laid flowers in an SS cemetery in Germany. The United States Senate then intensified that focus by ratifying the convention with caveats in 1986. The following year, demographer and anthropologist Russell Thornton published the first scholarly monograph addressing genocide in the continental United States as a whole. Thornton argued that genocide was one of several causes of American Indian demographic decline, but that only in certain cases did it cause total extermination. The 1992 quincentenary of Columbus' arrival in our Western Hemisphere catalyzed debate over whether the European conquest of the Americas should be celebrated or condemned, and increasing numbers of scholars 
began addressing the genocide question. American studies scholar David Stannard argued that Native Americans were victims of both disease and genocide. That same year, scholars Leonore A. Stiffarm and Phil Lane Jr. proclaimed, surely there can be no more monumental example of sustained genocide, certainly not involving a race of people as broad and complex as this anywhere in the annals of human history. In 1993, Stanford historian Richard White specified that instance of what can only be called genocide did occur against particular Indian tribes. But that does, make the entire, that does not make the entirety of American Indian policy genocidal. Ethnic studies professor Ward Churchill then asserted that genocide began with European invasion and continues today through genocidal internal colonialism. Other scholars then followed. Most recently, in his book, Blood and Soil, A World History of Genocide and Extermination from Sparta to Darfur, historian Ben Kiernan dedicated 88 carefully researched pages to, and I quote, colonial North America from 1600 to 1776 and genocide in the United States. In contrast, five different scholars assert that American Indians rarely or never suffered genocide. In 1992, colonial historian James Axtell concluded, genocide is an historically inaccurate description of the vast majority of encounters between Europeans and Indians. Certainly no European colonial government ever tried to exterminate all Indians. And you can count on one hand the authorized colonial attempts to annihilate even single tribes. In 1994, Jewish studies scholar Stephen Katz of Cornell added, the depopulation of the New World, for all its death and tragedy, was a largely unintended one, a tragedy that occurred despite the sincere and indisputable desire of the Europeans to keep the Indian population alive. Five years later, Western historian Robert Utley asserted that applying the term genocide to the experience of American Indians grossly falsifies history, since no more than a tiny portion of the white population of the United States ever advocated intentional obliteration. Others then joined on this side. Two factors polarize this American genocide debate. First, not all participants agree on what the word even means. Second, most participants emphasize rendering a verdict of genocide or not genocide for the continental United States as a whole and sometimes the entire Western Hemisphere, from first contact down through the present. To move the debate forward, both issues must be addressed, beginning with the question of definition. The American genocide debate is, in large part, the struggle to define a single word, this term genocide. Most participants who started, stated a particular definition began with the United States Genocide Convention, but only standard Louis, Thornton, and Kiernan have accepted it in unmodified form. So what happens is that uh, rather than go through all the definitions, I'll just say that everybody has tried to come up with their own specific idea of what genocide means. And there are two main things that they try to define. They try to define who the protected groups are that might be a valid group for consideration. And they debate what the crimes might mean. And in general, the people who refute the idea that genocide could have happened at all in the United States or ever take these five uh, kinds of crimes and they limit it down to the intent to destroy all people carried out through specific acts, and those acts are killing. So genocide is, I think fortunately, much more than an abstract academic concept. It is a crime that is clearly defined by an international legal treaty and subsequent case law. On December 9, 1948, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the convention unanimously and without abstentions. It remains the only authoritative international legal definition, and unlike the at least 20 alternate definitions preferred since 1959, it has teeth. Now entering its seventh decade, the UNGC, has been signed or acceded to by 141 different nations. In addition to its prima facie authority, the 
The convention definition is supported and further defined as a legal instrument by a growing body of international case law. Actual cases using this statute from the previous slide as uh, the method of trying uh, people for the crime of genocide. Since 1993, the international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and the former uh, and Rwanda have tried genocide cases using this convention. The International Criminal Court at The Hague, established in 2002, is also empowered to try genocide suspects under the convention. And I would predict that within the next few years, we'll probably see several more people tried there, not just from Europe, but from Africa as well. The United Nations Genocide Convention definition is thus part of an international legal regime of growing importance, and as such, is the most widely accepted definition and the most powerful one. The Genocide Convention provides the best definition for investigating the question of genocide in American history. This is one of my main points of my talk, is that we ought to get away from this abstract uh, discussion about the definition of genocide and stop quibbling about it and get down to brass tacks and start using what is a real, tangible, legal instrument as our, our means of definition. The second factor polarizing the American genocide debate arises from both sides' focus on rendering a verdict of genocide or not genocide for the continental United States as a whole, and sometimes the entire Americas from first contact to the present. This is a case of lumping, I would argue, when splitting is in order. Contact between American Indians and non-native peoples spans centuries. It ranges over 2,959,000 square miles, and it involves interactions between British, Dutch, French, Mexican, Russian, Spanish, Texan, Californian, and United States regimes, all of which changed over time, and hundreds of different American Indian peoples, themselves hardly homogeneous or static. With the exceptions of Thornton, Standard, and Kiernan, scholars on both sides of the debate have largely avoided in-depth analyses of particular regions in particular times or particular tribal people's demographic experiences. This dearth of specific studies, I would argue, along with the definitional differences, helps explain the American genocide debate's abstract and unresolved nature. It is difficult to argue meaningfully about genocide on a national level without either definitional agreement or robust local studies to support broad conclusions with evidence. Thornton blazed an important trail by bringing brief tribal case studies into his argument. Standard then touched upon genocidal intent and genocidal actions. More recently, Thornton noted that, and I quote, physical genocide seems much more characteristic of years and decades than of centuries. While Kiernan demonstrated the importance of regional studies, emphasizing genocidal intent, command structures, and genocidal massacres. Still, as British historian Dan Stone noted in 2008, it is absolutely remarkable that given the enormous historiography on the colonial period and frontier conflict in North America, there is almost nothing addressing the question of genocide in its history. Despite pioneering work by Thornton, Kiernan, Stannard, and others, there remains a need, I would argue, for additional highly detailed case studies providing the data that permits an assessment of genocide's occurrence and frequency in United States history. So how might new studies be done? In-depth tribal and geographical case studies covering discrete time periods first require locating markers that signal the possible presence of genocide. Annihilationist statements, massacres, and mass death of American Indians in federal policy in federal custody are three ways of locating and ultimately defining prima facie cases of genocide. White policy makers discussed or articulated intent to annihilate Native American peoples both before and after 1776. And I'd like to give you a few examples that will give you a sense of the prevalence of these kinds of statements and policies across time and space in the history of the Continental 48. As early as 1622, Virginia colonies' leaders responded to an Indian attack by planning, and I quote, a sharp revenge even to the rooting them out for being longer a people upon the face of the earth. That's as early as 1622. In 1711, Virginia's colonial house of Burgesses advocated extirpating all Indians without distinction 
of friends or enemies. Fifty-two years later, during Pontiac's uprising, Field Marshal Jeffrey Amherst ordered a subordinate officer to extirpate this execrable race. Thomas Jefferson then became the first United States president to consider intentional extermination, and as Kiernan has pointed out, repeatedly wrote of the possibility to officials, friends, and correspondents. The idea became increasingly common. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson told the United States Congress to overcome, and I quote, melancholy reflections resulting from driving Indians to the tomb. He did so with this cheerful thought. True philanthropy reconciles the mind to these vicissitudes as it does to the extinction of one generation to make room for another. Americans listened. By 1862, the United States Army General John Pope wrote a subordinate officer, and I quote, it is my purpose to utterly exterminate the Sioux Nation, end quote. Military and political leaders sometimes condone such policies. Six years later, General and soon-to-be President Ulysses S. Grant warned the, settler, warned the settlers and emigrants must be protected even if the extermination of every Indian tribe is necessary to secure such a result, end quote. The following year, General Philip Sheridan reportedly proclaimed, the only good Indians I ever saw were dead. Less famously, in 1873, the head of the United States Army, General William T. Sherman, who made numerous similar statements during the course of his career, telegraphed subordinate officers that in attacking the Modoc people of Northern California and Southern Oregon, I quote, you will be fully justified in their utter extermination, end quote. Even as late as 1886, Theodore Roosevelt announced, I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indians are dead Indians, but I do believe that nine out of ten are, and I shouldn't like to inquire too closely into the case of the tenth. Like President Jackson before him, the future President Roosevelt argued that American Indians' destruction, quote, was as ultimately beneficial as it was inevitable, end quote. Of course, some documented exterminatory statements may have been no more than rhetoric. But I would argue that words often do lead to actions. Thus, the route from annihilationist language to exterminatory methods needs to be very carefully delineated, since expressions of genocidal intent alone do not constitute genocide. Massacres were often the physical manifestations of annihilationist statements. Defined here as predominantly one-sided intentional killings of five or more non-combatants or relatively poorly armed or disarmed combatants, often by surprise and with little or no quarter, massacres and the study of them can serve four separate functions in re-examining the American genocide debate. First, massacres are a hallmark of genocide from antiquity through Darfur. The substantial known number of massacres itself also suggests an important need to more thoroughly examine the American genocide question. Second, reporting of massacres may flag regions or times where non-Indians and their allies committed genocide against native peoples. Third, the killings themselves may constitute genocide, or at least what is called genocidal massacres, which sociologist Leo Cooper defined as, and I quote, the annihilation of a section of a group, men, women, and children, as, for example, in the wiping out of entire villages. Finally, the close study of patterns of repeated massacres may help to locate genocidal intent and to uncover underlying command structures. The map here uh, locates 50 reported major massacres, each involving the killing of between 19 and 1,000 Native American people in 30 states between 1539 and 1890. And I should point out that it is in no way uh, comprehensive. 
the earliest massacre I found is in 1539, but have found massacres into the 20th century. Uh, but as you can see, I started to run out of room on the map. And I also like to point out that in my dissertation, which I just submitted, I describe over 300 massacres and mass killings in California between 1846 and 1873 alone. But on this map, I've just shown, I guess, three of them. So what I hope is that detailed investigations of specific regions and specific native people's national histories will help reveal perhaps a greater density of massacres both across time and space than what you do see on this map. Taken alone, massacres on the scale of Sand Creek or Wounded Knee or Mystic may be demographically insignificant overall Native American population decline, as historian Richard White has suggested. But I think that as scholars study massacre clusters and move towards calculating the total number of Indians massacred in American history, the cumulative demographic impact of these killings will be revealed. And as an example, I just would say that in my own dissertation, I found the direct murders documented not through oral history, but through non-Indian uh, contemporary documents from the 19th century of somewhere between eight and maybe 15,000 people. Um, and that's just stuff that's documented often in ref official reports. Mass Indian death on federal custody during forced removal and on reservations may also indicate genocidal crimes as defined by the United Nations Genocide Convention, including the specific crimes killing members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, or imposing measures intended to prevent births among the group. Examples of mass Native American death under federal custody are substantial and may provide fertile grounds for investigations of possible genocide. 19th century removal and incarceration on federal reservations often proved lethal. I'd like to give you a few examples. Over 4,000 Choctaw people died of hunger, exposure, accidents, and disease during and immediately after their deportation under military guard to Oklahoma during 1832 and 1833. Some 700 Creek people died while being marched from Alabama to Arkansas in 1836. In total, perhaps 8,000 Cherokees died, more or less as a result of the Trail of Tears before, after, and during 1838. Several decades later, some 1,300 Santee Sioux were taken to Crow Creek in 1863. Less than 1,000 of them survived to see their first winter there. To the West, settlement policies, murders, abductions, massacres, rape-induced venereal diseases, and willful official neglect at Round Valley Reservation reduced California's Yuki people from over 5,000 to not more than 600 between 1856 and 1864. The long walk, pictured here in this slide to New Mexico's Bosque Redondo Reservation and subsequent malnutrition and illness, then killed perhaps 2,000 or more Diné or Navajo people between 1863 and 1868. Inadequately fed 94 Cheyenne, incarcerated in Oklahoma died between 1876 and 1878, while in 1884, some 400 out of not more than 2,600 Pygon people starved to death at Montana's Blackfoot Indian Res Agency. Again and again and again, mass Indian death followed the imposition of federal custody in the 19th century. In those times and places where intent to destroy, massacre, and mass death under federal custody appear, it makes sense to investigate the possibility of genocide. However, each population decline requires careful, detailed investigation, be it the Connecticut Pequot in the 17th century or the California Weot in the 19th. Questions of genocidal intent, actions, and consequences must be meticulously investigated in each individual case. In the absence of robust case studies, general statements about all or most Native American tribes are extremely difficult to substantiate. Moreover, the stakes are too high for such an approach. Careful analysis of specific regions and tribes will provide the crucial building blocks 
upon which later meta-analyses can be built. By examining each case in detail, scholars will dignify its particularities and ultimately help to create a clearer, more vivid mosaic of varied American Indian experiences and of United States history as a whole. The old world pathogens that non-Indians carried in their blood, mucus, saliva, and semen killed untold numbers of American Indians. But the weapons in their hands and the ideas in their heads also led to mass violence and, in some cases, genocide. It is not surprising that scholars have written so little about this topic. The violent crimes Native people suffered during America's con conquest are very painful to con contemplate and cannot be reversed. Yet rather than distancing ourselves from this history, we need to move closer to it. Possible cases of genocide are worth investigating for many reasons, but I'd like to leave you with three. Decency demands that even after victims are long gone, we preserve the truth of what befell them so that their memory can be honored and repetition of similar crimes deterred. Justice demands that even after perpetrators have vanished, we document the crimes that they and their advocates have too often concealed, denied, or suppressed. Finally, historical veracity demands that we carefully examine the American Indian demographic catastrophe in all its varied aspects and causes in order to better understand one of the formative events in both Native American and United States history. Thank you.